Um, first of all, thank you all for your patience. You've been sitting a long time, and in physical therapy, that wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> That's bad wellness. Um, and secondly, I appreciate the opportunity to come before such a distinguished group, and Eric did a fabulous job of introducing, and it appears that medicine and physical therapy are actually on the same pathway about how they're approaching it, but perhaps we did it earlier. So um, let me give you a little bit just to divulge that um, I am employed by the American Physical Therapy Association and about to celebrate my 24th anniversary with them in the association. And I started when I was four. Um, I did serve as one of the developers and the original and actually we've had our second generation now in the tool that we'll share with you. Um, and that actually I'll share with you a little bit of the presentation, the publication. There are five uh, simple goals I'm going to try to approach today, and you can read those. Um, those that are uh, obvious, I'm going to actually share with you pieces of our tool. I cannot share everything because of its copyright, number one, and number two, it's all web-based right now, and people purchase to use that, and you'll see in a minute. So I guess I'm going to start with the first question, why in the world did we go down this road? And we started the road actually back in 1993 when we began to look at the assessment issue a long time ago. And there were certain things going on in the environment that are not unlike today. Um, we do have licensure as our credential. All PT and PTA programs have licensure in all 50 states, so you have to be licensed to practice. And we do have an integrated model of clinical education, and they're called either clinical experiences or internships at this point. What started was um, the curriculum requirements have changed in our profession from baccalaureate to master's, and now by as of 2015, they're all doctorate, and there's only one program remaining in Puerto Rico that is not DPT. So our evolution is a little different than nursing. We've dropped the degrees and only have an associate for PT and a DPT, uh, for the PTA and a DPT. Things that were going on in healthcare when we started this process with the Balanced Budget Act that changed, and now again, healthcare reform that began as a driver. The curriculum requirements have continued to change with accreditation, and we moved from very specific tasks to outcomes based accreditation and changed our degrees. And the cost and time required for each institution to develop their own assessment has become exceedingly cumbersome at the time. We had proliferation of student assessments, and there were over 150 of them at the time when we started this process, and clinicians were fed up. They could not learn if they took 25 different programs, 25 different instruments, of which none were valid and reliable, and which none they could remember. That's where we were at when we started this process. Um, academic grievances and litigation were falling short. There was no consistency in validity and training. They did not hold up for affective. We couldn't flunk them. There were a number of issues that started that whole process. And then the practitioners, there was no standardized training and performance assessment, so everybody was making their own interpretation. And then demands on practitioners for productivity, cost containment, and they're even more so today, was the driver. But the real sense of urgency and the compelling call for the change, the clearing call, was programs were going to lose clinical sites if they didn't take their tool. That was the bottom line. And all of a sudden, academic programs decided they could enter the conversation because they couldn't afford to lose sites for their students. That was the bottom line, that was the driver. So what happened next is, these you already are aware of, and there are some things that we said, well, as we develop the tool, they have to meet benchmarks of what is good um, assessment, validity, reliability, et cetera. But the other one that was really important, which was one of the issues that we were falling short, was the litigation and the academic grievances. And so we were given some wonderful consult from legal counsel that said you must build in an EWS, an early warning system, that gives a student every chance for success. And if they don't succeed, then you have to be able to remove them from the program and do it as early as you can. It's a travesty to let it go later, and the courts have said that. Um, the other thing is it has to be candid and objective evaluation. And you have to have measures to be able to dismiss. So that was the, the fundamentals that went into the tool. We said, OK, no matter what, we have to be able to do that. I'm not going to go line by line, but I'm going to tell you it did follow principles of what would be good instrument development. And there is no holy grail. Um, and it went through initially in 97, our first phase, you'll see it's a four-year phase to develop this assessment tool. 
and it went through a number of pieces that started with a lit review at the time. What were the agreed upon behaviors, the outcome behaviors that clinicians and academicians could agree on? Now, I want to tell you that's a debate. That's not a discussion. <laughs> it is a debate. So we went in knowing that we have to have the debate because the two of them were not on the same page about what is it we need in practice for readiness and what does the academy do. That was probably one of the best conversations we had. The instrument was the vehicle that drove that conversation. Um, we did go around and host multiple forums that had well over 2,000 people involved across the country. We came to them. We also came to Canada because they were interested in the same thing at the time, and we hosted several in theirs. We did pilot studies with over 300 clinical sites and over 100 of the programs involved that they wanted to be part of the pilot. We had some reviews of the draft. We did the typical psychometrics you would do. It went back, and because it was a board of document, our board of directors, they had to approve the funding. And then we made the original publication available in a print version. Now, we learned some things, good and bad. And the thing I would say to nursing is, if you start it, it won't be perfect. It's OK. It gets a start. You'll see that this is now 10 years later, and we're in our second iteration, and we learned a great deal. We went from 24 criteria to 18 performance. We had some things that were in a rash analysis showing to be not observed frequently. The tool now requires that every item is complete. There is no not observed. They occur in every clinical setting, in every practice, and in every different internship. And a minimum of most of them have four or more. So whether it's women's health, whether it's hospital-based, outpatient-based, emergency medicine, they comment on all 18 criteria. And they apply to all of them. And you'll see how we did that. Um, we integrated more research and what we had learned over 10 years about the document, we were able to begin to make more changes in terms of improving the document. We originally had a visual analog scale, and that scale, although shown to be reliable, people said it was too subjective. So we went back into the literature, and actually we came up with the same type of scale that they came up with Eric, but we used ours from Patricia Benner, so it's a little differently. Um, but use from beginning to advanced beginner, intermediate, advanced intermediate, entry level, and then beyond entry level. And you'll see what's happened as a result because of our internships in DPT. We had to have a beyond entry level um, for a couple of our programs that were actually moving into longer clinical experiences. So again, we went through a, a pilot study with this. We tested it. We had more debates, discussions. And one of the amazing things we learned is that the first tool was written in academic jargon, and we are asking the practitioners to complete it. And they said, if you want us to complete it, write in a language that we actually understand. And so there was an interesting conversation about what does this mean to you and what is this that you're using? And we began to get some perhaps synergy about what language was in terms of an academic and what it was practically. And they were, had an interesting conversation, which is, that's what that means? I had no idea. So we, within our profession, we weren't even speaking the same language. That's probably not good. Um, this has helped us to speak the same language across those dimensions. Um, we reorganized the rating scale. We actually had the scale first, and people would set the scale and rate it and then justify it. Now we give them the comments and qualitative first, and the last thing you do is rate because that's what we wanted them to do in terms of the process. So we also have these five red flag items that have changed. If you get a check mark and a red flag item, that's a significant concern that warrants an intervention. It is a red flag that you're at risk of failing, and it warrants an intervention, and a critical incident report will pop up on the screen, actually, and they have to complete that, and a learning contract is negotiated. So the early warning system is built in automatically. So let me show you our current uh, tool has these components in it, and they actually are similar to some of what um, medicine is actually having or moving towards. It has, it's a multidimensional system, and each page uh, triangulates. There are at least three ways you triangulate for consistency in the rating. We have 18 performance criteria that are outcome measured at the highest level. Each one of those, there are five that are red flags. One of those are clinical reasoning, which we found to be a real problem area. Uh, communication is another one, ethical and legal behaviors, et cetera. Each item has sample behaviors. They are illustrative. They are not exhaustive, but are, they are core behaviors that you have to see that in totality say, when I see those, that equals the outcome. When those are missing, I know we have a problem. They're not exhaustive, but they represent any setting that they would be applicable to. Um, there are qualitative narrative comments you do at mid and final. There are five performance dimensions. We went to our instructors and said, what do you use to rate? And they gave us these five dimensions as how they judge, make judgments. So they use those. Uh, the rating scale is six well-defined anchors and five intervals. From a research standpoint, 
each of the anchors between is statistically significant. The interval means you're in between. It is not statistically significant within the interval, but it allows the clinician to make small judgment changes to show the learner they are progressing or not progressing within that interval. Um, we have a significant concerns and then we have a summative piece. So I'm gonna show you a page of what it looks like in the printed version. Online it looks very different, but that's what the printed version. So every item has a page that looks like this. So it has the outcome, and you could see that would apply to nursing just as well as it would to physical therapy and safety. It has our sample behaviors. These were agreed upon by the entire profession by consensus. They do represent and reflect what would be safety. Then you'll see that our five performance dimensions are here at mid and final. Then they rate. And by the way, each of these are defined using those performance dimensions plus caseload. They all say at the end, capable of carrying a caseload independently because they are, cannot technically do it independently because of Medicare, Medicaid, so we have to use the term uh, capable. And then we have a significant concerns box that they check. In the electronic version, the web base, when they check that box, automatically an email goes directly to the coordinator on site and the coordinator of the program that's a warning there's a problem. They can see this anytime, anywhere, iPad, iPhone, they can travel and see any of the students who are out of the normative range and who need assistance if they fall below a norm. In the process the way it is now, they actually have selection of performance criteria, so it's a voluntary tool. They are not obliged to have to use this. 93% of our programs use it. One of the uh, states that currently does not use it is Texas, but I'm telling you that probably is changing because Texas is sending their clinic students outside and they are all using CPI. They have to register the programs, register annually for use of this tool. It is part of, it's managed by an external vendor, so uh, the association does not have access to any individual student or program record. We can do aggregate data, which we're starting to compile about what does it look like over time across all of these dimensions, and at entry level, what percentage of the students are really at entry level when they graduate, because that is the rubric that says you cannot graduate without entry level. In order to access the tool, everybody, and I mean everybody, must take an online standardized training that is test, uh, has been tested. It was somebody's doctoral dissertation, actually. So it is a standardized tra training that really teaches them how to do the rating based on case scenarios. You can't pass it by guessing. You really have to understand the rating scale. When we did the study, you had to pass with 100%. Uh, now you pass with 75%. But that means students, clinician, practitioners, faculty, all to access the system must take the same training. So we've had over 80,000 people take our training. It is free and they get CEUs, but it's the way we enhanced reliability. They all take it the same way. They can access it any time and they learn it the same way. That's probably when one of the single most important things in the tool is the training. Um, the preceptor completes it on the st um, student and the student does a self-assessment and you can actually compare them online and see how they're doing in assessment processes. There's immediate notifications and built in the system, we have the learning objectives, weekly planning forms, critical incident reports and learning contracts. And then the program can manage individual student data by performance criteria, aggregate reports, and then we actually have national reports that we all can do in the web-based tool. So. What lessons have we learned in having to do this over almost a 15 year period? Uh, the first one is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That has been the success in building a bridge and, and engaging the debate and understanding that's a part of the process, it's okay, and listening and listening and listening. Um, one of the things that are here, some of the other lessons that were important, you have to have an open culture and when you solicit the feedback, you have to show that you've integrated it. Don't solicit it and just say, I heard it. We showed them draft after draft and they saw the changes, they could point to their comments. You have to be ready for debate because it's part of the process. If you don't want debate, don't bother entering the process. And it was, it got to be fun actually. I would instigate it after a while and just say, what, you don't like this? And that, that would start it. Um, you have to balance buy-in of the profession along with psychometric rigor and help them understand that and the legal essentials. And it's an interesting balance to understand how does that fit. So for instance, we always had a global overall rating, but we found out that the global rating was higher in a halo than the individual ones and legally it wouldn't stand up. We dropped the global rating and nobody said boo. It was never mentioned. But we had angst the day over the group about dropping that. 
Uh, incorporating all the elements and dealing with the academic jargon was a, a big aha in the second version. The standardized training actually empowers our preceptors. They go back to programs and said, wait a minute, you're telling me where to score this. That's not how it is. I'm supposed to observe and objectively rate based on multiple performances. Don't give me what you want and bias me. So they understand the 10 types of rate or bias in the training, and they understand halo and leniency and diversity, all of those. Um, you have to give support. Academic and political faculty needed support in moving to a web-based tool. The hardest thing was not the new tool. It was the technology. We started with nobody will use it, and now nobody wants a paper version. So you know, what's today is tomorrow. I got yelled at the first year. We can't do this. And the next year was, where's the web-based version? Speed it up. What's with the paper? We're wasting paper. And we did voluntary use. By voluntarily using it, it's become part of the infrastructure and part of accreditation looks for those reports. They actually have a report they can print that matches the evaluative criteria against the CPI. They push a button and the report gives it to them for accreditation, which is a huge, huge investment. Um, any assessment system has to be affordable and accessible uh, and standardized for all users. Um, the clinical assessments need to be dynamic. We have to constantly go back and revisit this now with patient-centered care, et cetera. I have to do that. And the resources we invested, the R&D over this period of time has been well worth it. It's advanced the profession. It's advanced our ability to make some decisions about curriculum and students. And it's also helped to identify those students when they need help or need to leave without any litigation, which has been huge for all of you who have been through those. We're actually at a point now that the CPI is being used by some states for foreign educated to assess their readiness for practice in this country because we're at doctoral level. It is a part of their curricular rubrics. It's now being used in some places for new grads their first year beyond entry level as part of their assessment. We've uh, recently had requests for translations in other languages and also for other professions to begin to use this. So finally, what are some net recommendations for nursing? There's always going to be early, middle, late adopters. You have to start the process and hope that over time people come on board. If you wait for everybody, you'll never get it done. You have to be willing to stick your neck out and realize some people will never like what you do, and that's OK. They come around. I still am hopeful that Texas in my lifetime, I'll see them move to the CPI. Um, Develop consistent uh, profession-based outcome competencies. Determine what those are and what is entry level to be ready for practice. And that's an interesting debate, but it's a good one. Once you develop that, have the psychometrics tools or assessments, multiple, and then consistent training. That was probably one of the most important things. And then to add to Eric's some research opportunity, these are my dreams that I'm sharing with you. Certainly, how do we begin to get outcomes assessments with patients, team-based care, triple aim he talked about? Where do we get assessments that ask patients, how are we doing with their care with students when they don't want the students? We don't have anything to ask them, is this OK for you, and how are we doing? How do we get some of these assessments to be common across interprofessional? Communication, ethic, and legal, safety. I think they actually could go across all the professions, and we could all use the same core, and it probably wouldn't be a problem. How do we get more assessment perceptor sensitive time? They don't have a line to fit time to fill out huge, lengthy things. And finally, could we get a funded, centralized resource with an interprofessional team that actually could develop an outcome assessment to be used across all health professions and actually bridge? That would be the big dream if you're going to have it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jody. Our next speaker is Lori Claybo. Professor and Dean of the School of Nursing at the Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professions. She's a faculty nurse scientist at the Yvonne Munn Center for Nursing Research. Laurie. 